Our boy woke up in a place which he could not recognize with stuff that was not his and he even tried touching his face which felt completely different and he kept wondering how all of that happened. His name was Iruma and a floating lady called Norn told him that she was sorry. She explained that her summoning magic randomly picked a number of people from different worlds and then they get transported to Midgard. Norn explained that her magic was forbidden but she was not going to stop using it because a country she hated used it as well. She added that when she noticed that something was off, she tried to intervene but there was no way for her to stop the summoning magic and Norn told Iruma that the other people which were summoned were also Japanese and they already arrived at the Holy Empire of Sidonia but Iruma asked Norn to transport him back to Japan if everything was just an accident. Norn got all anxious and she told Iruma that she could not reverse her magic but that did not hurt Iruma all too much as he had nothing to return to as he was already dead. She explained that she was not going to let his life go to waste and that if he wanted she could resurrect him as a man from Midgard with her divine protection. And she told him all about Midgard to get Iruma to like it bit more and he was drawn to the usual skill and level system. When he opened his status bar he realized that it felt exactly like a game and he was surprised when he saw that his age was 15 years old which Norn explained was an apology she also added that he would not be able to save or continue his progress as that was not a game and it was the real deal and she asked him about which class he wanted to pick Iruma always played crafting classes and he chose the alchemist class with a recovery support class just in case he needed it and Norn had given him the body we saw at the beginning. She also told him that she was not going to send him to the empire of Sidonia because it was too hard for beginners and that was how Iruma found himself in the file which he could not recognize in a completely new world. When he checked his protection status it was completely hidden due to the fact that the time and experience point he needed to level up were extremely little and just by scouting around he unlocked two new skills he tested out his magic and when he summoned a small water ball Iruma was completely surprised and he noticed that there was magic all around him in the form of tiny particles in the air those tiny particles drew his attention to all sorts of plants and types of grass that were lying all around him and he spent some of his time collecting them and he stored everything into his item box for later use. He took a wooden branch and by using some of his blacksmithing magic he turned the branch into a stick which he equipped with a blade he had in his backpack and he thought to himself that it would be nice if he could come across a village. He walked for quite some time but the longer he walked the more he thought that the world was weird because he had not come across any humans nor the signs of civilization. It was all just pristine nature. However, just then Iruma got a notification in his head that there was a human and a magical beast nearby and he realized that a young boy was being chased by the beast. The boy ran to him when he saw Iruma and Iruma took his newly made spear and stabbed the rabbit before it could harm them. The horned rabbit was a level 5 monster and Iruma thought to himself how that was not a big deal for new players and the boy thanked him and explained that he was from the Bowd village which was nearby. The boy was also harvesting medicinal grass and he told Iruma that he was going to take him back to the village with him. The boy told him to bring the rabbit as well because it was tasty and Iruma placed it into his item box because it was heavy and the boy was shocked with his skill. After some talk they arrived at the village and the boy immediately ran towards two men, Mr. Banga and Mr. Bonbon who told him that his mother was looking for him. The boy explained that Iruma had saved him from a horned rabbit and Iruma told him that he left his village once he turned 15 years old and that he started his journey while collecting materials wherever he could. Banga was a hunter and Bonbon was a blacksmith and they told him that the majority of the materials around their village were medicinal herbs and they also had a mine nearby so the place was really convenient for craftsmen. Iruma was delighted and he asked the men if he could stay in their village for a little while and since there were no inns in the village they decided to build him a home. While Bonbon was gathering people, Banga explained that they had materials in storage and the house would be over in no time if everyone worked together and Iruma was completely surprised 
but Banga told him that that was the least they could do because he saved one of them and he offered to show him where his new house would be located. Banga explained that it would be on the village border and next to the lumber storage and right then the rest of the villagers came to meet him which made Iruma feel like he was home and because of that he wanted to do what he could to help them as they were building a house for him after all and he used his earth magic to flatten the area. Benga was really surprised and he told Iruma that since it got too late he could stay in the house that night and his wife Martha came to greet Iruma. While they were walking over to Banga's house, Noren was watching over Iruma from the sky and another woman asked her if she was expecting great things from him since she had given him her divine blessing. Noren explained that she met countless souls until she met Iruma, but he was the first one that she believed was not biased against other races and since she believed he would never misuse his powers, she decided to give him a gift. The woman teased Norn for giving Iruma a younger body and sending him three years into the past before the Empire of Sidonia fell and Norn explained that she only wanted to make sure that he would be ready in case of an emergency. Norn explained that she was going to take a nap and she kept telling herself that she had no special expectations from Iruma since he was just a small pebble in a pond which was Midgard but she hoped that he would make great waves. Iruma woke up after a couple of days in his own house and he really loved his new body because it took him less time to rest. He was really happy with his new house even though it was pretty simple and modest but Iruma was aware of the fact that he could not have made it without the help of the villagers and that day he was going to accompany Bonbon to the mine. Once they arrived Iruma was able to see that it was an open pit mine which surprised him and Bonbon gave him the tools which he could use for that occasion but he told him that he could craft himself new equipment with materials they find there. As soon as they started digging Iruma unlocked the mining skill and when he found his first iron ore he noticed the tiny magic particles which showed him all the places where he could find the ores and that allowed him to quickly level up his mining skill. Iruma got a sudden burst of energy when he saw a lot of the ores and he kept mining like a maniac and when Bonbon told him that they should go back Iruma kept on mining like crazy. Only after a couple of tries later did Iruma notice Bonbon and they realized that they've mined too much so they stopped to take a lunch break which Martha prepared for them. Bonbon thanked Iruma because he managed to mine so much ore that day, especially the magic iron ore which was rather rare and Bonbon explained that after refining it, it would become magic steel which created weapons which could use magic power. Iruma wanted to learn all that and Bonbon explained that even though he was a blacksmith he was not really good at teaching and while Bonbon was wondering about how they were going to carry all that ore, Iruma explained that he could carry everything and he used his item box to store everything. Bonbon thought that every time someone used an item box their mana would get consumed but Iruma tried telling him that that was not how things were and only then did he remember that normal people did not have an item box and they saw it as a holy skill. The only thing he could come up with was saying how his item box was simply different and they walked home together and Iruma thought to himself that he would have to be way more careful when it came to how he used his magic. Once they got back Iruma tried putting some of his magic powers into stones to try out his alchemy skills. Iruma found a manual which was stored in his memory about alchemy and its five main skills which were explained by Norn and the main principle of alchemy was the fact that something could not be created out of nothing and the alchemist had to be proficient of the things that he or she was trying to create and the session was ended by saying how everyone had the potential to do alchemy and it only needed to be mastered. Iruma believed that he was familiar enough with the basics and he took the iron ore to have his first try. He first disassembled, the ore extracted the needed parts and by using his earth magic he was able to put everything back together and create an iron ore and he was happy even though the magic power he consumed was high. Since his first try was a success, Iruma was encouraged to work more and more and that was exactly what he did but due to overworking himself Martha found him on the floor the following morning after he had passed out. 
Banga explained that if he continued making stuff out of nothing, he would faint again, and Banga was impressed by the things he managed to create from shovels and other gardening tools. Iruma created all the necessary kitchen pots, knives and utensils. A lot of his skills were leveled, and Banga gave him a healing potion so he could restore some of his strength, and he told him that even he could create potions if he wanted, and Iruma remembered all the grass and herbs he gathered right before coming to the boat village. However, Martha scolded her husband for telling Iruma to work even more and she told him that he needed to rest before anything else. Martha explained that she had bought some bread and she turned around to cook breakfast for Iruma and her husband and even though Iruma tried to protest by saying he could do it on his own, Banga told him to sit back and let her cook for them. They had breakfast together and Iruma told them that they would not have to worry about him as he would be more careful next time and he thanked them for taking care of him. Banga told him to give them some potions if he managed to make any while Martha scolded him like a little kid by pulling his cheek. Iruma spent the rest of the day going around the village and he thought to himself how the village was really nice and how he managed to acquire a lot of skills without much effort and he wanted to do something to pay the villagers back for treating him nicely. A couple of days later, Iruma was in his house cooking and he was amazed with how the color changed after he kept adding some grass and he remembered how he used to cook when he was a kid and after some stirring, he finished making some beginner healing potion. He immediately compared his healing potion to the one he was given by Banga and Iruma's was clearly better since it was not muddy and he thought that the reason for that was the fact that he used magic water instead of normal water. Since his recipe worked the first time, Iruma thought to himself that it would be great if he made more and he wondered if there were also recipes for potions that could recover magic power and stamina. He knew that he would not be able to find all the information he wanted in that small village and that made him want to live in a big city which had a library where he could read about everything he was interested in. Iruma was so focused on cooking the potion that he completely forgot that he had no potion bottles which saddened him but he decided to go to the riverside to distract his thoughts from his failure. After a while we see Iruma panting and holding his stomach like he was hurt only to use a healing skill on himself. He repeated the process over and over again so he could become poison resistant and he got that idea because that was a really popular thing to do while playing games. Next up, he started eating some hallucinogenic mushrooms to drug himself on purpose and then he proceeded to cure that as well and he continued doing so with various other plants after he finally leveled his healing magic up to the point where it became purification magic and he was able to purify his body from all sorts of poison and toxins. That was his goal because he wanted that ability not only for healing purposes but for container purification as well. And on top of that, along the way, Iruma had become super resistant to all poison which made him happy. However, while he was celebrating, he failed to notice a huge armored boar sneaking up on him and he realized that he was not in a good spot as he was only equipped with his spear. The monster rushed at him and Iruma managed to dodge, but he was aware of the fact that if he got hit even once, that would be the end for him. While Iruma kept dodging the monster's attacks, he unlocked a new skill which made it easier for him to dodge, and while he desperately kept trying to think of something, his intuition kicked in and he decided to jump over the monster and use his disassembly skill to defeat the monster. He was completely shocked by what he managed to do on his own, and he stored the monster into his item box. He thought to himself that he forgot to use his scouting skills because his life in the last couple of days was peaceful. And he realized that he could not go back to the village with his body all bruised up and he used his purification skill which fixed his body and even his clothes were fixed and they looked brand new and Iruma thought to himself that with that skill there would be no need for him to take baths or to wash his laundry at all. Just when he was about to go back to the village, Iruma sensed something which did not show up on his enemy reconnaissance radar and when he looked a bit closer, he found 
found a big poison spider's corpse, but his system told him that the spider could evolve because of its special condition, Iruma thought to himself that the spider was on the verge of death and it was probably the boar's doing, and when he used his purification skill on it, the spider's status changed to fatigued and Iruma was given the choice of taming the monster, which he accepted because the spider already looked at him as a friend because he saved its life. Iruma wondered if the village would be okay with him having a monster pet and he decided to put the spider into a small bag which he carried on his bag. Once he got back to the village he noticed a fancy carriage and he could immediately tell that it was not from the village and he saw an unknown face talking to Banga and Martha. The man's name was Papek and he had a trading business in Volton, and Iruma wondered what Banga told Papek about him. Papek was really amazed with how courageous he was, but once he got closer, he lost his common sense when he saw Iruma's potion, and he begged him to let him have a look. Iruma simply said that it was a beginner potion, but Papek told him that that was the most high quality potion he had ever seen, and when Iruma explained that that was just a prototype, Papek was convinced that he must have signed a contract with a guild or a pharmacy. Iruma said that he did it in his own kitchen with his beginner alchemy skills and Papek bowed down and asked him if he wanted to work for his company as he explained that his company made the best potions that existed and Iruma's potions surpassed them all. Papek felt ashamed and Iruma was certain that he could improve his potion even more which shocked Papek and Banga had to interfere to tell Papek that Iruma was probably getting uncomfortable and Papek apologized for his behavior. Iruma told him that if he wanted to see the finished product, he could contact him once he perfected his potion and Papek left the village feeling rather happy and hopeful. Iruma told Banga that Papek seemed like a good person and Banga told him that his eyes light up whenever he sees something good and that was just how he was. Iruma then took out the huge armored boar and asked Banga if he should disassemble it and while Banga was completely shocked, Martha asked him if he was injured. Banga was really happy when Iruma said that he wanted to share the meat with the villagers and Banga told Martha to call someone to help them prepare it. Banga explained that the boar's skin and fangs could be used for crafting and he told Iruma to prepare himself for the feast and Iruma was happy that the boar made everyone else in the village happy as well and he thought to himself that he would talk to Bonbon about the equipment he could make from the boar's materials. Iruma went back to his house so he could let the spider he tamed move freely and even though it was a great spider, he was not afraid of it at all like he normally would be. And Iruma thought the spider looked cute when he petted its head. He left the spider to rest while he tried making the bottles he needed for his potions and even though his desire was great, he was not seeing much progress. While he was cooking his potions, he felt that it absorbed some of his magic power and he ended up creating a potion of extraordinary quality which still glowed after he took it off the stove. Iruma was not ready to show everyone what he managed to do, so he stored the special potion and he then continued making more and more. After some time, Iruma spent living at the boat village his spider covered the inside of his house with spiderweb and just when Iruma took it into his hands to scold it, the spider started evolving and all of its skills leveled up and it even got the ability to speak as it said its name was Kaede. As Kaede was now talking, she told Iruma that she was hungry and while Iruma wondered what to give her, Kaede climbed on top of him and just then, Martha opened the door and was terrified after seeing the spider. Iruma explained that the spider was his servant and he told Martha that there was no need to be afraid since he ordered her not to go out of the house. But Martha thought that she was cute at second look and said that they would have to show her to everybody else. Martha immediately took her out and the first place they went was to the sewing master in the village where Kaide gave the woman some thread and Iruma's body was measured because Martha believed that he would be able to learn sewing and measuring better if he experienced it firsthand. And when the woman started taking off his clothes, Iruma freaked out, but the other woman grabbed hold of him until the measuring was complete. Several hours after that, Iruma spent some time with Kaede, and he told her that she needed to eat a lot because of how hard she worked. 
And Martha came to thank them and she brought a bucket of the boar's internal parts and organs. Martha explained that that was the most delicious part, but since it could be poisoned, it needed to be properly cleaned. And she immediately thought of Iruma. Iruma explained that he could use purification magic and once he showed her and once the meat changed color, Martha was flabbergasted. Iruma said that he would help her carry the meat back to the kitchen and Martha warned him that it would be a lot better if he did not use that skill in public because it was very rare and if word got out he would immediately be transferred to the capital and live there for the rest of his life. Martha told him that he would probably be safe inside the village because not a lot of people knew about that magic, but she told him all that so he could be careful whenever he decides to leave, and she explained that she would serve that meat with other parts so no one would ask where it came from. Later that night they started celebrating and Iruma had to sit down because he was completely full. Banga, who was completely drunk, came to Iruma and started babbling nonsense while Bonbon asked Iruma about Kaide, who had been playing with and entertaining the children. Banga was so drunk that he started crying and telling Iruma that he was the main reason the village had gotten livelier and he asked him not to leave their village anytime. Banga crashed out onto the grass and Bonbon asked Iruma whether or not he was interested in the outside world and he advised him that he should travel the world since he was still young and very talented and if he journeyed across the continent, his talents would significantly improve. Bonbon was lonely and Iruma noticed that so he told him that there was still much he needed to learn from the villagers and from him, which cheered Bonbon up and Iruma thought to himself that even if he ever left the Bode village, he would always keep a fond memory of it due to the good time he had there. Immediately the following day, Iruma started working on his blacksmith skills under Bonbon's tutelage, who kept telling him what he needed to do and what he needed to pay attention to. As soon as the blade was heated well enough, Bonbon told him to dip the blade into oil and after it cooled down, Bonbon inspected it and he was satisfied with Iruma's work as the blade was completely black and Bonbon explained that that was exactly how magic steel behaved. They took a break because smithing with magic steels was a lot more taxing on the body and Iruma also realized that when the blade absorbed the magic, it became much easier to shape and Bonbon explained that that was the best blade he had ever made in his life because of the magic steel. Iruma did not know that the magic blades could also be enchanted and Bonbon explained the whole process and he even gave him the dagger they made as Iruma was actually the one that spent the most time making it and he asked Iruma how he was doing with armor making. Iruma was a bit confused but he told Bonbon that everything was going well because Kaede was helping him and Bonbon told him that he could always come to him for advice and they continued with their work. They finished sharpening and polishing the blade and Iruma went home to Kaede who was now speaking more fluently and she had a gift for Iruma. It was the armor set he was working on but even though it was a perfect fit for Iruma, he still had some doubts because he looked like an assassin when he wore it. Iruma was frustrated as he was imagining how his story of him wanting to be an alchemist would not sit well with any guild if he appeared in his assassin armor and he realized that he was trying too hard to be discreet. He completely forgot that he would have to wear the armor he was making and he knew that he would have to make it anew and Iruma decided to stash it for now and to continue working on it once he had moved to the city. In the meantime, Iruma spent his time in the village, helping the villagers with anything they might need help with and studying from everyone he could learn something from. After some time he finally finished his dagger and they both, Bonbon and Iruma were happy that it was finished. However, even though Iruma spent his time amongst everyone, everyone in the village seemed to know that he was leaving the village. Bonbon told him that he was missing and he asked him about when he was going to leave and Iruma explained that he heard that Mr. Papek was going to come back once again to the village and he was probably going to leave with him. After their talk, time passed quickly and when the time of his departure came, Banga cried and told Iruma to come visit them again as he saw him as his own child and as a farewell gift. 
Martha brought him a cloak which was made by the sewing masters as a thank you for K-Day's thread. Iruma thought to himself that he should be the one thanking them and not the other way around and when it was time for him to get on the carriage, Martha told him that his house would remain untouched so whenever he came back it would be ready for him and after bowing down, Iruma thanked them for everything. As everyone was waving at him, Iruma went to meet Papek's assistant. He was happy for the fact that a completely new journey in his life was starting. The carriage started going and Iruma saw that there were other travelers in the back with him. Two men, one of which was crying and one woman and Papek's assistant explained that they were from the adventurer party, Leon's Fang. The crying guy's name was Heath and the woman's name was Lyle and the bald man was Voga. They explained that the trip to Volton was short, just a couple of days, but Heath was still confused because Iruma had no luggage with him and Iruma explained that he wanted to minimize carrying stuff because he wanted to buy new stuff in Volton, but the main reason was that he had his item box, but he decided that it would have been better to keep quiet about it. However, Iruma knew that he could not keep everything a secret and he decided to tell them about Kaide and Lyle was completely shocked when Iruma explained that Kaide was a killer spider, but even despite all that, she could not wait to see her. Iruma told them that she was still sleeping in his bag, but he said that they could take a quick glance and because Lyle was acting hostile towards her, Kaide jumped at her and Voga caught her while Iruma kept apologizing to Lyle. Heath explained that she was at fault and in the meantime, Kaide was enjoying Voga's company. A few days later, they arrived at the city gates, the capital city of Volta in the kingdom of Vakira. Iruma was really happy and excited about the city and since he did not have an ID card, Iruma was told that he could get his residency card for 5 silver coins and once he gets issued an ID card, he would have to return the residency card and get his 5 silver coins. They entered the city and Iruma was surprised after seeing beast people, dwarves and elves as well. Papik was happy that Iruma loved the city and their first stop was at the Adventurers Guild because Heath and the others had to make a report on their request. Heath explained that they could register him and said that they would take them to Papek after they were done and Papek was also glad because he had to stop by at another place before going back to his company. Iruma and the others went inside the guild and when the receptionist told Heath that their job was finished successfully, Heath said that they wanted to register Iruma as an adventurer. Heath and the others left and told him to meet them at the tavern and when the receptionist gave him the application form, Iruma explained that he never intended to become an adventurer. The receptionist told him that he would never recommend the production guild since the entry fees were too high and the magician's guild was not functional. When Iruma asked him about the alchemist's guild, he was shocked when the receptionist told him that such a guild did not exist and he added that some adventurers only registered to the guild to get their ID cards. The receptionist explained that if he managed to complete a simple task every month, his registration would still last and that idea appealed to Iruma so he decided to apply after all. Iruma filled out the application form and the receptionist asked him about his servant and was completely surprised because that was the first time anyone ever brought him a killer spider wrapped in a bag. His registration was completed and Iruma went straight to Papek's company where Papek told him that different guilds had different rules and policies and Iruma took out the health potion which he promised to him. On top of that, Iruma also created a potion for mana and stamina which he did not have a recipe for and Papek asked him if he could mass produce them. Papek needed a hundred of each and he would pay 10 silver coins for the health and stamina potions and he would pay 50 silver coins for each potion which shocked Iruma so much that he almost choked. He thought that Papek was paying him too much money because they were all beginner potions but Papek explained that they were of the top quality and he even told him that even though if he sold his potions to his company he could still sell his potions to guilds and shops and Iruma thanked him. 
Papek explained that he would pay him half of the agreed price in advance because he might need money and Papek explained that he would never offer that to a new business partner but his potions were of the highest quality. Iruma explained that he would stay at an inn for a little while and he also explained that he did not really need much equipment for his potions as he mainly used magic in making them. Papek explained that they might also give him a house with a workshop and that he could stay there as well but Iruma thought to himself that Papek was giving him too sweet of a deal and he started becoming suspicious. While Iruma was at the guild, Papek went to see someone. Two women were talking about Papek and the women were interested about whom Papek had found that time. However, one woman did not seem interested and was rather angry. Iruma kept looking at Papek who was still smiling and he did appear kind and generous. And Iruma used his intuition and search skills to look for any potential threats but he really could not find anything, but he did end up scaring Papek with his intense staring. Iruma was up front and he told Papek that the deal was looking too appealing to him and Papek apologized to him as he explained that the reason behind that was the fact that he wanted to keep working with him in the future and the money he was offering to him was not only because of potions since he heard that he had made the water pump in the village which Iruma created from his memory. Iruma told him that those water pumps were not using magic and that everyone could use them which surprised Papek as he only heard of a magic tool that could put out water but his water pump could save a lot of poorer people. Papek therefore asked Iruma to take care of those tools for the company because he would be really grateful to him if they could help people with them and Iruma agreed on certain conditions. Iruma wanted to send half of the sales from the water pumps to the Boda village because that was where he came up with the patent and that would help the village. On top of that, Iruma explained that he wanted all of the authorities for the water pumps to be in the Boda village and Iruma explained that he did not want to take all the credit. The last condition Iruma had was the fact that he wanted to make the water pumps affordable even for small villages and Papek took that matter seriously and said that his company would take care of that. Papek told him that they would confirm all the terms and conditions after they speak to the delegates from the village and he offered to show Iruma his new house the next morning and he could sleep at the company for the night. The following morning Iruma woke up and he was met by Thomas, Papek's servant, who told him that Papek had already left for the boat village to negotiate the conditions for the water pumps and Thomas explained that he would tell him everything about his new home. Iruma thought that he would be given a modest house with working equipment and once they got there he was completely shocked when they arrived because they were standing in front of a huge mansion. Thomas explained that it once belonged to a merchant and he told Iruma that the whole mansion was going to be his while Iruma thought that he would only be staying in the warehouse. Each and every room they entered was wider than the last one and once they entered the bathroom Iruma got the urge to take a bath even though he could still use purification magic. When Thomas told him the renting price Iruma could not refuse as the offer was too good and Thomas told him that in comparison to the market prices the mansion was rather cheap. The reason for that was that the mansion needed a lot of fixes and repairs and Thomas explained that the previous owner was still alive just in another city. Thomas said that he would take him through all the properties that Papek was offering him but the next one was even bigger so Iruma immediately decided that he would be taking the mansion they were in because it was already spacious enough and it was something he could afford. Thomas explained that he would be able to move in in 7 days and Kade overheard the entire conversation and she looked happy because they were getting a new house. Iruma asked Thomas for some wood and clay for repairs and Thomas said that he would arrange them in 2 days and Iruma already knew where he would start. In the meantime Iruma was staying at an inn called the Golden Barley and a little girl called Molly asked him if he was going to the library or the company that day. However Iruma explained that it was neither of the two options as he wanted to repair his house 
so he could move in the following week, and since Molly offered to reduce his fees if he knew the day of his departure, Iruma explained that she could make him lunch boxes for a couple of days with that money. Molly told him that she would inform her mother and the workers in the kitchen, and when Iruma left, he could not bear the smell coming from the city streets. Normally, the priests in the city would purify the sewage system every once in a while, and even despite that, the smell was too strong and Iruma realized that they could not handle the amount of waste. However, Iruma did not care that much because his house was a bit further away from the city center and he asked Keide if she was comfortable in the bag that was enchanted with a skill called subspace. As soon as he got to the mansion, Iruma started crafting something using the materials he prepared beforehand and he used magic to make sure everything went fine. However, Iruma's mana was depleted and he had to take a rest because he could not make everything all at once. While he was resting, Katie told him that Papek had arrived and Iruma told her to show him into the living room while he drank a mana potion to recover from the depletion. However, when Iruma arrived at the waiting room, Papek was not there and Kaede could swear that she properly guided him to the waiting room and after looking around, Iruma noticed Papek under the sheets on the bed and he saw Papek sleeping. Papek explained that he tried talking to Kaede but she could only converse with Iruma because of their contract and Papek explained that he simply fell asleep due to the softness of the fabric which was made from Kaede's thread. The reason behind Papek's visit was the realization of the formal contract for the water pumps and Papek told him that they were hoping to start with official sales by the end of the following month and Bonbon was going to help them with production and they already had a lot of requests. Papek also explained that Iruma should also partake in the sales because he was still the inventor even if he did not want that information publicly known and Papek gave him the payment for the potions he delivered. Iruma already spent some money on the house repairs but he was happy because he was still making profit and when he mentioned that he would need some strong people for manpower, Papek told him that it would be best if he bought himself a slave which immediately reminded Iruma of sex slaves for some reason. That made Iruma decide to only pay for manpower when it gets really necessary and he offered Papek to show him around the house so he could see the things he had already repaired. They went around the house and Papek was really surprised to see a lot of things changed and improved in such a short time and Iruma told him that he had been using the warehouse as his workshop. However, Papek's attention was drawn to a strange item Iruma had been making and the item was nothing else but a toilet bowl which still was not finished. Iruma explained that he wanted to attach a special magic tool to the finished product which would purify the excrements and that it would turn them into clean water and that would eliminate the foul smell in the city. Papek was completely blown away with Iruma's creativeness and his aptitude for light magic which made Iruma remember what Martha told told him about that. Iruma quickly told Papek that that information was secret and Papek already knew that without him saying that and he still told him to consider purchasing slaves because if he hired someone his talents could get leaked and slaves could be bound by magic. On top of that, Papek asked him to come with him to a slave company which made Iruma realize how special and rare his light magic was. Papek took Iruma to the Mulein slave company and he noticed that. Iruma was having second thoughts but he was completely shocked when he saw that the owner of the company was a sexy woman named Mulen. Mulen already heard of Iruma from Papek and Papek explained that he brought him there so he could see for himself firsthand that slave companies were serious and reliable and Iruma explained that the whole concept was new to him as he was coming from a village also known as a completely different world where slave ownership was not a thing and Mulan laughed and said that his village must have been a really peaceful place. Mulan explained that slaves were never needed in rich rural areas and she assured Iruma that slaves had their rights which were protected by the Balkira country and she added that she was even working on a magical contract between the slaves and their owners that would tick all the boxes of the slave protecting policies. Iruma read the contract and Mulen reassured him that her company not only sold slaves but they also identified the buyers and their personalities and he was surprised when he saw that the slaves were organized into types, debt, criminal, war and illegal slaves. Papek explained that they would love to buy either war 
or illegal slaves, which could help Iruma with his production and crafting, and those things needed to be kept a secret, and Iruma added that having slaves would be the best thing for his work to remain a secret. Mulan explained that her slaves would cost from 50 gold coins all the way to 3 platinum coins, which Iruma did not have, but Papek offered to pay them for him because he wanted to have him crafting and mass producing as soon as possible. However, even though Papek was really excited, Mulan shouted at him to stop his enthusiasm because she was not going to allow anyone, and not even him, to pay for another person's slaves. And she asked Iruma if he was forced to do business with Papek, but Iruma explained that because of him, he was able to succeed in such a little time, but he did tell her that he still was not ready to own a slave, and Papek apologized for getting too worked up. Iruma explained that he would come back once he was ready to be a slave owner and Mulan said that she would wait there for him whenever he was ready and she told him to have a walk around the company while she and Papek had a private talk. Iruma spent some time looking around the place all by himself and he thought to himself that it looked more and more like an ordinary mansion but that changed when he found some stairs which led underground. He was too scared to climb down so he continued searching around the company when he stumbled across a balcony with a fair lady sitting on the fence. She immediately started shouting at Iruma telling him that he needed to go back to where he came from because he should not be there and their conversation was interrupted by a small girl who thought that Iruma was still a child. When he explained that he turned 15 just recently, the little girl explained that she was also an adult and the fair lady said that they were still kids after all and she left the terrace and entered the mansion with the little girl following her inside and Iruma was left all alone on the terrace completely confused. After that, Papek apologized to Iruma and Iruma explained that there was no need to feel sorry because his company was actually the one letting him earn money and survive. Papek explained that if they increased their product's production, they could make lots and lots of money and Papek explained that the only problem would be with Iruma's toilets because they would use light magic, which the church kept a close eye on. The church would be infuriated if they found out that their holy magic was used on toilets and they had the empire of Sidonia watching their backs. Papek explained that that could start a war and when Iruma grew worried, Papek said that he would show everyone the real strength of his company and he explained that he had a secure sales channel in mind but he needed to confirm his thoughts by scouting and following everything for a month. Papek asked Iruma if he could make a prototype for the toilet bowl in the meantime and Iruma said that he could make them immediately if he could manage to create enough purification stones imbued with magic. Iruma said that he could probably make them on his own and he also wanted to modify the other equipment in the toilet and Papek said that he would make all the arrangements for the materials to arrive as soon as possible and before Papek left Iruma he told him to be very careful even though the mansion he lived in was not really a place where people would normally walk around and he asked him to do his magic imbuing inside the mansion, Iruma reassured Papek that he would move and act as secretly as possible and he told him that Kaede would also help him. Iruma's motivation came from the whole thing being secretive and he felt like a secret agent. A couple of weeks after their conversation, Iruma and Kaede completely crashed out on their bed and Kaede tried to tell Iruma to take some breaks as he kept working without taking any breaks. Iruma said that he was almost done but he still felt like something was missing and Kaede told him that she could handle the rest. Iruma explained the magic tool that looked like a decoration for the toilet which would activate the purification magic at regular intervals and he showed Kaede how the magic circle was made with multiple languages so it could not be analyzed. On top of that, Iruma divided the magic circle into multiple layers, so even disassembling it would not work, as people would not be able to put it back in the right order, and even he himself was happy and satisfied with his secrecy. Iruma also explained that he installed those magic tools inside their mansion so he could test them out and he thought to himself that changing the design would be good, 
but Kaede yelled that she had no ideas, she was hungry and Iruma told her that they would eat at the Golden Barley Inn because he also needed to do some shopping because he was missing magic stones which he needed for production. Once they had their meal, Kaede crashed on a bench and Iruma was really happy and he even got himself another lunchbox so he could concentrate on his work and just when he was about to go back to his mansion, the bench he was sitting on broke. Iruma thought that he had broken the bench but a lovely lady told him that it had been broken for a very long time and she said that she was not injured but she pointed to Iruma's stuff which had been scattered all over the ground. The girl went inside to bring Iruma a new container for his stuff and he did not object because he could not use his item box in public. However, when he entered the place after the girl, he quickly realized that that was not her house and the place looked like a church. The girl explained that she wanted to get that bench fixed for a long time, but she never had the materials nor enough people that would do it. And even though people always told her to throw the whole thing away, she kept telling them that even the bench was a gift from the Divine Lady. Iruma quickly connected the dots and he realized that he was inside one of the Shinko churches and he thought to himself how he should stay away from them at all costs and the lady told him that Noren the Divine Lady was responsible for all creation. Iruma chose to act like he did not know a thing but deep down he wondered why Noren decided to side with Sidonia and immediately the following morning Iruma found himself talking to Norn, who told him that she was not a friend of the Holy Empire of Sidonia. Norn explained that she had nothing to do with the Genesis Doctrine nor with the Shinko religion, and she explained how the two were different in the first place. Norn also told Iruma that he was inside the Genesis Doctrine church that mentioned her, and she explained that even though the Shinko religion spread throughout the continent, the Empire of Sidonia used force to instruct belief into their citizens. The use of force made Norn sad as she told Iruma that the Shinko religion used to take away the kids of the other religion and that the people had to pray in secret, hiding their scriptures and whatnot. Iruma thought to himself that the simplest solution would be for her to intervene, but Norn said that she had no authority to do anything anymore, which sounded paradoxical to Iruma as she was the one that interfered when she gave him special treatment. Norn got really angry as she was explaining that she only did so because Iruma was not part of the target group and she reminded him once more that she was not related with neither the Shinko religion nor the Genesis doctrine and she wanted him to know that she was not cold-hearted because she could communicate with the people that deliver prayers to her. Norn also added that the blessing she had given Iruma was special and that it could transform and transcend as his worldview expanded and to put it simply, his blessing was like a buff given to new players during the tutorial of the game. Norn told him that he needed to pay more attention to the people around him as he would not be protected by her all the time and Iruma wondered if the sole reason behind his good relations with others was Norn's special blessing. That was all she had to say and when Iruma thanked her, he realized that she had confiscated his lunchbox as an offering and when Iruma was back in the church, he could not contain his despair. Iruma explained that he heard bad rumors about the Shinko religion and the lady explained that the whole conflict between the two churches made her sad and she reassured Iruma that such things would not occur in the town of Bolton. Right then, a little boy walked in to call the woman, which he referred to as Sensei, to tell her that it was his snack time and Iruma apologized and said that he needed to get home. Iruma got out and with little hesitation, he used his magic to make a shoe rack from the broken bench as he could not bear to look at it all over the ground. On his way back, Iruma told Kaede that they would have to pay attention to the bad guys and Kaede immediately started hiding her lunch and her snacks. Just a couple of days after that, Papek was in a meeting with a mysterious man and Mulan told the fair lady that he was no ordinary guest and the fair lady thought to herself that she would be better off in her room as the place was getting more crowded each day. When she left, Papek thanked Mulan for lending him her meeting room for the day and Mulan explained that slave companies are not primarily in the field of enabling private talks 
but Papek said that he had nowhere to turn to. Mullen told Papek that he owed her big time and Papek anxiously said that he would give her something that would satisfy her. Papek then told Thomas that he would go to Iruma's mansion while he should go to the Chamber of Commerce to handle the customer's conditions and while on his way to Iruma, Papek thought to himself that he had really good news for him. In the meantime, Iruma was sleeping and Kaede woke him up once Papek arrived and Papek was really shocked when he saw the state of his mansion and how tired Iruma looked. Iruma explained that he could finally give him the prototype for the toilet bowl, but once he removed the veil, Kaede was stuck inside. She disposed of some of her waste into the toilet bowl and was sent flying by the gust of water, and Iruma told her that his prototype was not a toy she could have fun with. Iruma tried to fix what she broke down, but it seemed that Kaede had used the magic toilet bowl a bit too much and that was why the water was sent upward instead of downward and Iruma told Papek how his magic toilet bowl worked. On top of that, Iruma explained that he could also modify the whole thing so it used less magic and more water which made Papek really satisfied. Iruma explained that he wanted to use his light magic as little as he possibly could and Papek told him that that was a good idea and Iruma told him to have a rest wherever he could find free space to sit down and relax. Papek explained that he would only be selling the toilet bowls to Australian merchants and nobles and he explained that he already found a customer for the magic purification tool Iruma crafted earlier and the customer was none other than the lord of the city and the territory around, Sir Godwin von Burton. Papek said that he would take the prototype home so he could have his men run estimates about the production costs and their potential sales and he asked Iruma to make more. Papek told Iruma that he should rest until he brought a formal request for new magic tools and Papek said that they would finally be able to buy him some slaves, which Iruma was not delighted with. When Papek left, Iruma was completely exhausted and that feeling of exhaustion grew even more when he realized what a mess his mansion was in. Keita hid something from him and when Iruma took it from her hands, he saw a guild card that was shining because he had a notification which said that he needed to come to the guild at an appointed time so he could do at least one quest before his card expired and even though he was dead tired, there was nothing he could do. A couple of days later, Papek brought Iruma his salary and Iruma could not really comprehend that he had in front of him coins worth around 100 million yen and Papek told him that they sell his toilet bowls with some other shares from the commerce so they were able to sell them at 10 gold coins per piece. On top of that, they already had around 200 reservations for them and Papek yelled out that that was simply how much his purification magic was worth and he explained that the smell in the city was becoming unbearable and that they had to do something about it. Papek also added that the Shinko church charged way too much. For their purification services and the lord of the city wanted to deal with the sewage problem as soon as he could and that was why Iruma's magic toilet bowl was like a ray of hope in total darkness. Papik explained that for now they were only selling them to rich merchants and aristocrats but as soon as they established mass production they would settle on a lower price which would enable even ordinary households to buy them for themselves. Papek asked Iruma to come with him but Iruma explained that he needed to be somewhere else due to his contract and Iruma went straight to Mulen's slave company. Mulen knew that he would come back but she was surprised because he came way too fast and Iruma explained to her why he needed to buy some slaves for himself. He was way too busy with his production that he could not even keep the house clean and he needed someone to do that for him. On top of that, Iruma also needed to gather materials from time to time and he needed someone that could protect him and fight for him and that would make a total of two slaves which he would need for starters. Mullen explained that they had one slave which could manage the household chores and she was one of the kidnapped and illegally sold children and her name was Maria. Maria was the girl that stumbled into Iruma the last time he was there and her price was 80 gold coins and Mullen smacked her when she said that Iruma was just a child. Iruma wanted to ask Maria a couple of questions and Mullen left them alone for a while and before he could say anything. Maria enthusiastically told Iruma that he was a great customer because Mulan approved of him. 
Apparently, it was way too hard to get into the slave market, either as a buyer or a seller, and Iruma asked her if she would be willing to come work for him. Maria said that she would most probably manage to do everything on her own based on the number of rooms, and Iruma then told her that he had second thoughts because she was a girl, but that only made her blush and embarrassed. And Iruma felt like he had just sexually harassed her. While Iruma tried to explain himself, Maria shouted out how she would not be able to fulfill her night duties if he asked her to, and Iruma realized that she completely misunderstood him. Maria explained that men only bought slaves either for labor or fighting, and ultimately they would also buy sexy women for sex slaves, and despite their misunderstandings, Maria explained that she would like to come work for him, and when Mulan came back, Iruma said that he was satisfied with her and how she responded to his questions and his conditions. Mulan also asked Maria if she would be content if Iruma became her master, and Mulan told Maria that she always used to tell her that she would be sold one day and transferred to a new home. Mulan apologized to Iruma because she did not have a war slave that could meet his requirements, and Maria interrupted her by saying that Sophia might be suitable for that position, but Mulan got angry when Maria mentioned her name. Iruma was confused, and he asked Mulan if he could see that slave in person, like he did with Maria and Mulan, decided to show her to him. However, once they entered another room, Iruma saw the fair lady he talked to on the terrace the last time he was there, and apparently she became a captive in the war between the kingdoms of Rhea and Yugur 50 years ago. Mulan introduced her as Sophia, and she added that her price was two platinum coins, and Iruma explained how she ran into her at the same time he ran into Maria. Mulan explained that the Yugur kingdom was the kingdom of elves and that was why she was captured. However, Mulan's grandfather was never able to sell her due to some deficiencies and disabilities. Mulan showed Iruma that her left ear was missing and that her left foot and right arm were injured. And even though she could live normally, her power in combat was not significant. On top of that, she said that her special magic was sealed and normally such elves were being sold as sex slaves and Iruma thought to himself that he could maybe lift her curse and Mulan realized that he wanted to talk to her directly and she calmed Sophia down and said that they would just have a chat. Sophia explained that she did not know his conditions but she explained that she was unable to assist him and she advised him to look somewhere else for a slave, and Iruma explained that since she fought before, and he wanted to check her status by looking her in the eyes. Iruma realized that she was really strong, but Mulan saw that which made Iruma feel uncomfortable, as it looked like he was making a move on her. Iruma explained that he was satisfied with the condition Sophia was in, and despite her objections, Iruma decided to buy her and said that he would work on fixing the source of her problem. Mulan asked Iruma what he thought when he said that he could maybe have a solution for the source of Sophia's problem, and when Iruma said that he really thought that he would be able to help her, Mulan started laughing like crazy and said that it would be her pleasure to sell Sophia to him. Mulan was more than happy to sell Sophia, and she said that she could now see why Papek was so obsessed with Iruma, and meanwhile Sophia started getting ready. Mulan explained all the contract details, and they went over the text together, and Mulan thanked Iruma for helping her get rid of her problematic children, and Iruma did not know what she meant by that, and right then, Maria and Sophia entered the room. Before they left for Iruma's mansion, Mulan told them to stand next to each other so she could perform the slave contract magic and she wished them good luck. Iruma went to the carriage before Sophia and Maria so they would have some private time with Mulan with whom they lived all their lives and while Maria cried since she was still little, Sophia was mature and she was ready to find the answers to her questions all on her own. Mulan told them that they should hurry as not to leave Iruma waiting on his first day being their master and just before leaving, the girls thanked Mulan for taking good care of them. Iruma told the girls that they would be living in his mansion which was in a mess 
at the moment because of the repairs which were underway and his production business as well. Maria was eager to start cleaning immediately but Iruma said that they should rest on their first day and Sofia told him that he did not have to be formal with them as they were his slaves after all. Iruma said that he would leave all the shopping to Maria as she was a girl and he wanted to introduce them to Keide but he could not find her in the subspace which he created for her which meant that she must be inside the house which Iruma felt sorry for because Sofia and Maria would have to look for her as well. Once they arrived at the mansion, Maria was delighted with how big it was and just when they were about to get inside, Iruma was attacked by Keide when he opened the door and he had to tell Sofia and Maria not to panic as that was just his servant spider. Kaide quickly got up and signaled them to come inside and Iruma quickly realized that she had cleaned the entire house. Iruma hugged her and they all sat together to have some tea. When Iruma introduced Kaide to Sofia and Maria, Kaide immediately went over to the girls so they could become familiar and Kaide and Maria went around the mansion so she could see all the rooms. When they left, Iruma put down his tea and he offered to show Sofia her room and even though he offered her hand to help her climb the stairs, Sofia simply walked around him holding onto the fence. Sofia thought to herself that the room she was supposed to stay in was too luxurious for a slave but Iruma reassured her that everything would be okay as the mansion was big and had plenty of space. Iruma left her on her own so she could rest and when he closed the door, Sofia sat on the bed and opened the status menu which concerned her and just when Iruma climbed down the stairs, he heard a loud cry from the bathroom, he immediately ran to see what happened and he saw that Maria fell while Keide was trying to show her the way the bath functioned. Maria said that she had never seen a bath as big as that one and Iruma told her that she could try it out all alone that is. Maria immediately ran out to call Sofia to join her and Iruma was left alone with his thoughts of having a bath with two sexy young women which he tried so hard not to think. The girls prepared the bath for themselves and while Maria was enjoying every second of it, Sofia seemed concerned and after opening the status menu, she told Maria that their slave contract was a bit strange because they could not see any information about Iruma. Maria said that she heard that some masters preferred to hide their info but Sofia only thought that that would be an inconvenience for him. On top of that, Sofia was wondering about where Iruma got his money from and Maria told her that he must be working for a company, producing stuff for them like he produced that bath they were currently enjoying but Sofia thought that everything was too good to be true. Sofia said that she had concerns even about Kaide and Maria kept telling her that if Mulan approved of Iruma there was no way that he was having some ulterior motives and Maria explained that just when she was about to be sold she mentioned Sofia's name which in the end led to her being sold as well. Sofia had a lot of questions on her head and she was determined to get her answers and she walked out of the bath with Maria following her. Sofia was determined to find out who Iruma was and why Mulin was that happy to sell her off to him. Once they got out of the bath, lunch was already on the table which amazed Maria but when she found out that it was Iruma who prepared it, she broke down in tears because that was her job. Iruma told them not to bother themselves with such things and he explained that they should eat but Sofia explained that it was only natural for masters and slaves to eat separately because of the sheer difference in the power of their positions and Iruma realized that he never thought about such things. Iruma smiled and told them that for the time being they should just pick a chair and enjoy themselves in the dinner while he explained to them how he thought the whole thing would function. Iruma told them that he did buy them so they would work for him but he explained that the difference in their positions should not matter that much to them as he did not want to make any distinctions between them and he even added that the order of the beds was not going to pose any problems and when it came to eating he preferred sharing his meals rather than eating them alone. Iruma knew that Maria and Sofia were completely confused by his outlook and he told them that they could study and educate themselves and he asked them to call him by his name instead of master and they continued with their lunch. 
When they were finished, Iruma told Maria that he would have to go down to Papek's shop to buy something and he told her that the house would be left in her care. When Iruma arrived at Papek's shop, Papek told him that they usually did not trade in that specific item he asked for, but Papek said that he could not simply turn him down as he was after all his business partner and once Iruma took the item from Papek, he looked all around himself to find a secluded place where no one would see him open it. Just when he found such a place and was about to open the box, he was met by a familiar man whom he had met at the Adventurer's Guild. The receptionist explained that he rarely remembered the people that came to register, but since Iruma was carrying Katie in his bag, he simply could not forget him. Iruma explained that he was going fishing as not to come off as suspicious, but he remembered how his guild card was shining and he bowed down to the receptionist and told him that he would stop by the guild as soon as he could so he could finish one quest during his first month of being registered. However, the receptionist told him that that would not be possible as the guild had closed down and it probably would never work again and he explained that the reason behind that was the fact that the lord of the city entered the town secretly and he made them look bad. The receptionist also explained that they had been getting more and more unreasonable requests which slowed them down. Iruma kept thinking of Papek and whether or not he started selling their products to everyone instead of only to aristocrats and the nobility, but the receptionist told him that if he had not visited the guild yet, he could still wait some more, but he warned him that if months passed, he would become deregistered. Iruma promised that he would stop by and the receptionist explained that they would be waiting for him and before Iruma left, Hans asked him if he could forget about their encounter and he kept repeating that ever more menacingly, which scared Iruma to the point that he almost cried. When Iruma got away, he remembered Norn's words about how he might be approached by people who wished bad things for him and he started thinking to himself that he was actually the one that was analyzing things way too much. However, even despite the talk with Hans, Iruma ended up missing his deadline and he went back home. When he opened the front door, Kaide ended up punching him in the gut once again and Maria rushed to help him up. As Iruma's stuff was all over the place, Sophia crouched down to collect them, but Iruma immediately used his item box to store everything as he did not want anyone finding out about his special item he got from Papek and he asked them if they managed to clean the house. Maria explained that she searched the rooms, which she never did normally, but she found out that a lot of the furniture was destroyed or deteriorated and that it had to be changed and she added that she would finish the cleaning the following day. Iruma explained that he would stay in his working studio for a little while and he told them that they could eat together with Keide as he was really busy. Sophia also explained that she would wait in her room and Maria was left all alone with Keide but she did promise to call them once lunch was ready. However, Sophia could not stop thinking thinking about the special item she was just about to pick up and she was certain that it was wrapped with magic wrapping paper that does not let out any toxins or mana to leak out. Sophia wanted to see what the item inside the special box was and she went around to the shed where Iruma was working and she could hear him mumbling something. Inside Iruma was cooking something but his demeanor was different and he was holding a knife over his arm which was completely unlike him. But to go back in time for a little bit, when Iruma left the mansion, he saw that his workshop, which Maria called a garbage dump, had been completely destroyed. He immediately screamed and started using his magic to rebuild his workshop, which now looked exactly as his hut in Bode village. And when he entered the workshop, he took out his special item, which ended up being the Nenom grass. The leaves of that grass were extremely poisonous and before proceeding, Iruma had to extract the poison. He then took a pocket knife and soaked it into the poison and started cutting up his own hand and then later healing it with his magic. The experience was so painful that Iruma started regretting his decision and he thought that consuming the poison by eating would have been a better option, but he continued with his experiments. 
Iruma started becoming more and more tired and just when he was about to finish acquiring a new skill, Sophia barged in and she fell onto the ground. She managed to get up to knock the pocket knife out of Iruma's hand as she thought that he was plotting something against Maria and her or that he was trying to take his own life away and Iruma was really shocked with the fact that she had seen him. However, before Sophia could say anything else, her body gave up on her and she lost consciousness due to exhaustion. She scraped her left hand which was injured and because of that she could not even remain conscious and Iruma realized that his light magic's level had increased and right then Maria walked into the workshop. Even though she was completely shocked and surprised, Iruma shouted out how they needed to get Sophia back to the mansion and once they got her back to bed, Maria said that she did not have a fever and that she only needed to rest. Maria also added that she was like that before and her body would become completely tired if she got excited or if she moved a lot and that was the main reason she stayed on the terrace while she was living with Mullen. However, when Maria saw how worried and confused Iruma looked, she thought to herself that the reason behind Sophia's exhaustion was a sexual act between her and Iruma, which Iruma immediately denied. However, Maria had already come up with a fantasy of how there was love between Sophia and Iruma, and Iruma realized that it was already too late for him to right his wrongs, as Maria said that having sexual acts in a garbage dump was way too cruel. After a while, Iruma finally managed to explain to Maria that he was actually trying to activate a new skill, and that she got exhausted once she had seen him, and Iruma knew that seeing a man with a knife over his hand was a disturbing sight, so he decided to apologize to her once she woke up. Iruma explained that his light magic had reached a desired level when he tried to treat Sophia's wounds and he said that he was going to use it now to its full extent. Iruma extended his arms and after the whole room was covered in his magic light, he used his dispel skill and ended up saying how her body was healed and he also added that he managed to break the demon curse that was cast on her 50 years ago. Iruma explained that she should be able to move freely which would allow her to fight like before and Maria was so surprised and amazed that she thought that Iruma was a priest but he told her that he was simply a commoner and he said once again that they needed to let Sophia rest for a while. Maria asked to stay by her side and Iruma said that he was just going to tell her that and he left the room. The following day, Iruma was outside digging and Katie asked him whether or not he was concerned about Sophia's health and Iruma told Kade that he was certain that his recovery magic worked. While Iruma was using his magic to produce the magic tools, Maria observed him from the window like a child and just then, Sophia woke up and she explained that her body felt light. Maria quickly found a mirror to let Sophia see her own reflection, which made her realize that her magic was back since she once again grew her ears. Sophia thought to herself that she was dreaming, but Maria told her that she was fully healed and that it could not be any more real than that and she hugged her like they had not seen each other in years. However, Sophia started yelling at Maria and telling her how both of them should run away immediately as Iruma was dangerous and she explained that she saw him in the workshop, but Maria calmed her down by saying how it was actually Iruma that healed her in the first place. Maria went to call him so Sophia could see everything for herself and Sophia was left alone on the bed thinking about everything that has happened since she was sold. Iruma knocked on the door and he immediately asked her how she felt. He continued by apologizing for what happened at the workshop and he explained how it was all just a big misunderstanding and he told her the whole truth. Sophia was still feeling a bit down and Iruma thought to himself that she did not believe his story but Sophia explained that even if it was true the extra heal skill was the most valuable light magic in the world and she knew that the church was strict about who could use it and on whom it could be used. On top of that, she could not fathom the fact that Iruma was ready to risk his life to learn such a skill. And he explained that he was neither with the church nor that he gave a damn about their rules. Iruma explained that the sole reason why he wanted to help her was the fact that he saw in her status that her attacking characteristics were extremely high and he wanted to help her by lifting her curse and he reminded her how he told her that he would do something about her curse. 
Right then, Sophia broke down in tears. She got up from the bed and went down on her knees to pledge her lifelong loyalty to Iruma. Iruma smiled, extended his hand and said that he would be in her care from that point onwards and Maria and Kaede saw the whole thing which made them all happy. That night, when Sophia was away, Iruma told Maria that he was happy that her appetite was back and even though he wanted her to rest a bit more, he thought to himself that she was more than ready for work and Maria explained that she would not be able to forget the scene of her pledging her loyalty for a while because it felt like a knight swearing to protect the princess and Iruma laughed because he ended up being the princess in that story. Iruma explained that he needed to finish his quota for the deliveries the following day and even though his work was hard, Maria was enthusiastic to help and Iruma gave her a new set of clothes so she would not get her main uniform dirty. Iruma said that he had one more for Sophia as well and Maria rushed out to store her tracksuit in her room. Iruma woke Kade up and told her that they needed a bath and even though Kade was protesting, she could not do anything but listen to Iruma and not long after, the two of them were relaxing themselves in the bath Iruma commented how he was happy with the fact that Sophia had recovered and he added that he would have to make new clothes both for him and Sophia and Maria and he was scared when a window popped up with Nor notifying him about the update. She told him that he had models of the people and animals around him and that he could view them with his appraisal skill and he could see every detail he wanted. On top of that, Norn also told him that he could move the models and look at certain private parts if he really wanted to, but Iruma was annoyed by that comment. Right then, Kaide told Iruma that she had enough and he told her that she could go and wash up and he continued thinking about the equipment he needed to make. However, Iruma thought that Kaede came back, but when he turned around, Sophia was standing in front of him stark naked which startled him completely she entered the bath and closed the distance between them and asked iruma to take her completely just like she pledged in her room iruma was completely confused and he told her that such things were not in the contract and sophia explained that her actions had nothing to do with the contract as she swore all of herself to him and she wanted to do her best to make iruma feel good However, things weren't like they seemed they were as Sophia was completely disgusted as she felt she needed to do that and Iruma told her that they should only do sexual things if both of them were on the same page, which they clearly were not, and he left the bath without doing anything. Once Iruma got back to his bed, he thought to himself how he acted embarrassingly and he also thought that his mental age, which was way over 40, was slowly coming down to meet his physical age in his new body and Keida agreed with him. Iruma promised himself that he was not going to turn into a monster that only thought about sex and the following morning not a word was spoken during breakfast. Maria thought that there was something wrong with the food she made and Sophia finally spilled the beans and said that she had disappointed Iruma by trying to make him fall in love with her. She said that Iruma ran away from her because her whole body was dirty due to the curse and Iruma explained that she completely misunderstood what happened as he went away to his room only because he was surprised. However, Maria said that she was actually the one that came up with last night's idea because Sophia was worried that she was not able to do anything to repay her debt to Iruma for breaking her curse and Maria explained that she read something similar in a comic book. She believed that Iruma would have loved to have sex with a sexy woman and Iruma explained that it would be best for all of them if they did not rush with these types of things. Maria apologized but Sophia told her that everything was entirely her fault as she was the one that offered her body and Iruma told her that he could feel that she knew what she was doing was wrong. On top of all that, Iruma explained that he was happy with the fact that he knew that they wanted to do something nice for him and he was satisfied with their intentions for the time being and Iruma added that they should get to work. Iruma and Maria went outside to make toilets and Iruma realized that they would meet their delivery quota by the end of the day which made him happy. Maria thought that he would continue making other things after he finished with the magic toilets and even though that was true, Iruma told her that he wanted to travel for the time being as he was in interested in the world beyond his mansion and he wanted to explore hidden ruins. Iruma explained
saying that he would have Sophia accompany him in case they ran into some trouble and he wanted to entrust the house to Maria while they were away but Maria wanted to come with them as well so Iruma took her hand to check her status. He was completely surprised because her status told him that she would also be a very good asset in battles and he reminded her once again that traveling and battles went hand in hand and Maria explained that she would have it way worse if she stayed at home while Iruma and Sophia were gone and she thanked him for letting her accompany them. Maria said that she would ask Sophia to train her and Iruma told her to let him know what type of weapons and armor they liked so he could prepare them and Keide wanted to know if she was coming as well. Iruma thought to himself that Maria had some really good skills and he wondered how Mulen managed to teach them to her. Papek came to pick the toilet delivery and Iruma and the girls started preparing for their journey. The following day, while Sophia and Maria were training with wooden sticks, Iruma was busy crafting them their weapons while Keide assisted him. Iruma crafted a couple of different different blades intended for different weapons and he made them all from magic steel which was a smithing method he had learned from Bonbon bon back in Bode village. To finish the weapons Iruma only needed to attach those blades to handles and they would be ready and he thought to himself that it would take him much longer to make the armors. Before anything using his appraisal skill to get the exact measures of the girls right he created their mannequins so he could create fitting armor for them but he got this distracted for a moment by Sophia's breast. However, Kaede smacked him across the head and they were soon back to work. Iruma knew that the most important thing was for the armor to be functional but he also wanted them to be nice and he was determined to make the armor according to his own tastes. A couple of days had passed since Iruma started making the armors and Iruma was not entirely happy with the outcome. As he was looking at some reference books, Maria and Sophia came in wearing the armors he had made for them and looking sexier than before. Sophia realized that she managed to get accustomed to the armor too soon and Maria was jumping all around from happiness because the armor was easy to move in. Iruma was also happy because his enchantment spells worked and he asked the girls about their opinions on the appearance of the armor. The girls were super happy but Iruma thought to himself that they were not all too happy with the design and when Maria asked him about why she wore three throwing knives on her left thigh, Iruma explained that battle maids always threw them from their thighs. However, Kade brought another set of armor for them to try out and Iruma thought to himself that the girls would not like them but Sophia told Maria to try them out no matter what because Iruma worked hard to make them and that was how the armor making turned into a cosplay competition of who looked sexier in which armor and the whole experience left Iruma in a state of bliss. Before they continued with their preparations Iruma explained that he wanted to stop by the Adventurers Guild so he could get Sophia and Maria registered which would make their travels easier and Maria explained that when she was shopping the day before the guild was really quiet and Iruma said that they would go and see for themselves. Once they arrived at the guild they could see that the place was not crowded and that it was indeed quiet and when Sophia opened the door they could see that the guild was completely destroyed and the staff members were cleaning up the mess. Hans explained that the guild was in trouble and that they would not be working as long as they were not finished with cleaning up and restoration and Iruma decided to help because he needed to register Sophia and Maria. Iruma used his magic to fix, raise and erect a new reception desk in a matter of seconds and seeing that made Hans lose consciousness. While they were busy with making sure that Hans was okay, Iruma was grabbed by a bold man called Barak who was the guild master but he soon apologized to Iruma by saying how he thought that he was one of the barbarians that trashed the guild in the first place. Barak explained that Hans was only hungover but he soon got up and he asked Iruma how he managed to repair the reception desk so quickly. Iruma said that it was his alchemy magic and Hans explained that he got sick because he had never seen magic being used in that way. Iruma apologized and Sophia thought to herself that Hans's magic sensing skills were rather high and getting in touch with magic 
his body gave up on him and Barak confirmed that to be true as he said that his skill was convenient but most of the time it was annoying. Barak turned to Iruma to see why he came to the guild and he explained that he wanted to renew his guild card and register Sophia and Maria and Barak said that they would immediately get that done and they would also raise his rank while he was there and Hans explained that that was a good thing in Iruma's case. Barak explained that he had a constitution of a tiny kid and when others find out that he was an H rank adventurer who used weird magic and who had two cute slaves serving him everyone would try and molest him and Hans added that he would look at his rank and increase it if there appears a need. Iruma did not think that that was the right thing to do but Maria and Sophia agreed with them as they did not want to be molested or assaulted and Hans went to make everything ready. Iruma explained that they would help with the restoration of the place until Hans finished and Barak told him that it would be fine if he used his magic while working and when Iruma used his magic once again Sophia confirmed that it was only Hans who was sensitive to it because of his special sensory attributes. Iruma thought to himself that his magic was indeed weird but Sophia told him that it was more like a puzzle and she explained that she knew that there was no true way to do alchemy magic as it was very detailed and complicated and the results would always turn out uneven and that was probably the main reason why people could not understand it. Sophia explained that she liked it very much and the only thing about it was the fact that it stood out from other magic types and Iruma decided not to change anything for the time being. Barak went back into the document room where Hans was working and he asked him why he was so motivated for work that day and Hans asked him the same as he never entered the document document room, both Hans and Barak had the same answer and their answer lied in Iruma. They were interested in his abilities and they could not wait to see how everything regarding him would turn out. While Hans and Iruma were in the back, Maria and Sophia were given out their guild cards and the new receptionist was pissed. At Hans, because he pushed her some time before, when Maria and Sophia entered the meeting room, Iruma told them that he had finally accepted one request and he explained that his focus was on subjugation so they could rank up more easily. Hans told them that the request was an easy one because both the goblin and kobold habitats were a 30 minute walk away from the guild and on their way there they could collect the marill grass they needed to finish the quest. Sophia thought to herself that they should not have any problems in dealing with the goblin goblins or the kobolds, but she was confused since the request said that it was only for the G rank adventurers or above and Hans told her that it did not matter because Iruma who was their party leader had just been promoted to an F rank adventurer. Iruma explained that his rank up was due to the fact that he managed to collect some herbs while the two of them were closing their registrations. Iruma also asked Sophia to handle the combat part of their quest since he and Maria were not that experienced when it came to combat and Sophia explained that he could consider the goblins and the kobolds as being already dead. Hans told Iruma that the guild cards would immediately take note of the number of monsters they killed and everything else so it was necessary to carry them all the time and Iruma told the girls that they should head home as Kaede was waiting for them and they should prepare for their journey the following day. As soon as the following day dawned upon them they set out from Bolton in search of the goblin and kobold habitats and the one leading them was Kaede because she could give them the best information without being seen. She said that she was seeing one of the enemies every now and then and Iruma decided to move up ahead to see what was happening but Sophia warned him that since they could only see four enemies that something must be off. Iruma thought that the monsters looked cute and not dangerous at all but Sophia told him not to be fooled by them and she explained that she would take down two on her own and that Iruma and Maria should take the remaining two. Sophia quickly killed two enemies with one move and Iruma and Maria did their part of the job as well. The monsters dropped pieces of magical stones which Iruma decided to collect and they continued clearing out the monsters habitats. 
When they stopped to take a rest, Iruma thanked them for coming and he congratulated them on their skills and the girls told him that the armor he made for them was exceptional and it was only then that Iruma realized that he was not wearing any armor. Iruma fell into despair as he thought that the girls would make fun of him for not wearing armor and Sophia interrupted his thoughts by saying how the fact that the place did not have that many goblins before and it was quite possible that they were creating a colony nearby, Maria was all in on the idea of killing all the goblins if they were still underground but Sophia explained that it would be better to go back to the guild and report on the situation. Iruma called Katie to come back but she came back rolling on a huge ball which Sophia immediately recognized as goblin cocoons and right then high level monsters came out which was what they were most afraid of. Sophia managed to block the monster's attack and Iruma instructed Maria to help Sophia while he dealt with the big monster the goblin general. Iruma knew that he had to do something before it got too late and he started running in one direction to distract the goblin general. Meanwhile the goblin managed to injure Sophia and grab her by the neck but Katie came to help her and Sophia killed the goblin. However, both Katie and Sophia were injured and Maria did not know what to do. Meanwhile, Iruma was running away and trying not to get hit, but he realized that that was hopeless since he had no armor and he decided to go on the offensive and after stabbing the monster, he managed to kill it and earn himself enough experience points to level up more than 30 levels. Maria came running to him, holding Kaede in her arms and while Iruma was looking at her, Sophia walked over as well and it turned out that Kaede was only going through an evolution and that was why she was unconscious. After that Iruma healed Sophia and they returned back to the guild but they were completely exhausted. Hans was happy to see them but once he saw the report he bugged out for a moment and he called them into the meeting room because Barak wanted to talk to them. Barak looked angry and Iruma explained that they were only doing what they were asked to do by the request and Barak explained that the reason he was angry was the fact that whenever there are goblin generals they are always surrounded by low level goblins and the request ceases to be a rank free request and even the army had to cooperate with the guild to exterminate the monsters. Barak could not get himself to believe that some F and H rank adventurers could deal with that on their own. Barak could not understand how he was going to report that to the people above him. Maria asked Barak if he could just tell them that they managed to defeat the goblin general and have it end at that but Barak broke down and said that he could not do that and just then they were interrupted by Kayede who now had the upper body of a young girl and her lower body remained that of a spider. Kaede and Maria immediately hugged and Barak lost consciousness as he could not take any more stress and surprises. Hans explained that Iruma simply could not stop surprising them and he added that there was still a small procedure until they could go home and rest. Hans went to finish the administrative work and Barak woke up. He explained that he decided to tell the higher ups what happened and they went back into the meeting room to give Iruma and the girls their guild cards so they could go home but they found them asleep. Barak told Hans not to disturb them as they managed to do something incredible. A couple of days later Iruma decided that they had enough adventures and would go on any for a while but he was happy with his level ups because because he could now craft and produce other things. Maria came into his workshop to ask him if he had any scraps of cloth so she could make some underwear but Iruma told her to use Kaede's threads because they were of higher quality and Maria explained that she only wanted to make something simple. However, Iruma drew the modern bra and panties for her to see and she loved it and asked him to make it immediately. However, Kaede came to notify Iruma that Papek was there and that Sophia was beating him in the living room, which was an obvious lie. Papek collapsed as soon as he saw Kaede and that was why she was in a bad mood. But Maria told her that she was so cute that he could not handle it. Papek finally came to his senses and he immediately told Iruma that he came to see him because they had a problem. Namely, the sales of his magic tools were going well, but the fact that they all contained purification magic, they had to be sold with the backing of lords. Because of that, the first person to see the product was the lord and he wanted to meet with Iruma and Papek 
told the Lord that there was a special agreement with Iruma, which was that he wanted to keep a low profile, which only made the Lord want to meet Iruma even more. However, the Lord then said that he would have another alchemist come and analyze the magic products. But Iruma was not concerned with that as he created them in a way which would make them unable to analyze and Papik said that he thought the same thing, but the Lord told him something else. Namely, the Lord heard about an alchemist which defeated a goblin general and he would call that alchemist to reward him and have him analyze the products. But Sophia, Marie and Katie told Papek that that alchemist was also Iruma. Sophia explained that the meeting with the Lord was inevitable and Papek said that it would be best if they told the Lord everything. Meanwhile, Norn observed Iruma's every move and her servant asked her if there would be any trouble with Iruma and the other heroes that were summoned from Earth as the fall of the Sidonia Empire would happen in three years. Norn explained that the future kept changing all the time and that she could not expect anything. And she took out a recording of what happened to the other heroes. The video showed Akane, Mei and Yamato high school friends that were talking about an upcoming test when they were suddenly summoned to Midgard. At first they were amazed with the whole thing, but then a mysterious woman called them heroes. She wanted to make a request to them, but Akane acquired the skill called Divine and she kept hearing a voice which told her not to trust the mysterious woman. While the woman was trying to tell them why they were called, Akane kept hearing the same voice all over again and she tried to decline the woman's offer but Mei and Yamato convinced her to at least hear the woman out and the woman then finally introduced herself as Elizabeth. Norn then paused the recording and she explained that Akane still looked like a child and she could not tell what would happen to her and Iruma. However, she could not stop hoping that the two of them would succeed in changing her world for the better with the blessings she gave them. And we're gonna end it here for now, bros. I'm so sorry for the cliffhanger. I have to end it on the cliffhanger right now because... Actually, because these are all the chapters that are currently out of this manga, so stop calling cliffhanger police on me. I literally can't recap more chapters because there aren't none. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching, bros. As always, stay awesome and peace!